Well, good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Well, I've been in email correspondence with a gentleman named Michael Venozzi, and he lives in Nevada here in USA, and he is an abacus aficionado, and he's been updating me on a project that he's been working on, which is he's been reproducing the ancient Bronze Age Roman abacus. And let me read you his letter to me. Hello, Joe. I present to you my interpretation of an ancient Bronze Age Roman abacus. This handmade abacus replica is made completely of poplar hardwood with brass beads. I finished the abacus in a simulated aged bronze color. I hope you like it. And he goes on to say that the reason I'm making these Roman abacuses is to make the general public aware of their existence and ancient history. The Romans had several different versions and sizes of hand abacuses for different uses, including mathematics, market sales, taxation, architecture, etc. And then he gives a link to a very good video on how to use this Roman abacus. And I thought we would today take a brief look at Michael Venazzi's reproduction of a Roman abacus. Stay tuned. Well, Michael has made this really nice box and it is kind of aged looking and has these felt feet on the bottom, a uh, kind of bronze clasp and this really nice uh, nameplate with Abacus Romanus in Latin lettering. Ah, yes. So the inside lid is padded with this kind of uh, red velour felt. And this is a really very genuine looking abacus. So let's go and look at some of the place values and features of this. So if you've seen other videos about abacuses, you'll recognize most of this abacus is a 4-1, which reminds us of the modern Japanese soroban, which implies there's some interesting history going on here. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to show you that these little beads or uh, balls are actually captive inside the grooves. So he's using these brass beads and he's secured them with these self-tapping screws with brass washers. So those get secured underneath the frame where the, just the bead protrudes up above in the top of the groove. So it's a really nice solution to ensure that all your beads remain intact and they don't get lost as you're using it, which could easily happen. So that's a very cool solution to that. But if we start from this column and work our way left, we'll see that we have the ones uh, column, which these are the one beads. You raise them up toward the middle, just like you would with a Japanese soroban. And this is the five value beads that slide down, just like you would expect in a soroban. And then here's our tens column. Now you notice the Roman designation of the symbols. So we have tens here and fifties here. We have hundreds here and five hundreds here, thousands and five thousands. We have ten thousands and fifty thousands, hundred thousands and five hundred thousands and millions and five millions with this Roman notation here. And so it becomes essentially like a standard uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven column soroban from this column over. What I find really interesting about this though is that these values automatically match Roman numeral symbology. Maybe you took math class or some kind of history class and they told you that the Romans did not have place value system because Roman numerals doesn't have a place value system, but they had the abacus and the abacus does have place value systems. Now, Watch this. You remember Roman numerals? Here's your ones, right? Which is represented by the I symbol. Your fives represented by the V. There it is. There's your fives. Your tens are represented by an X, which are right here. Your fifties are represented by the L symbol. Hundreds are represented by the C. And your five hundreds and your thousands. And it goes all the way up. So the place values on the Roman abacus absolutely exactly match the notation of written Roman numerals. And that's why they didn't need a place value system in written notation. They already had the place values on the abacus. Now let's talk about these two right-hand columns. This 
column here, the second one from the right, is in twelfths. And so that's why it has an extra bead. You count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So zero through eleven. So basically it's in twelfths. And then these three short columns are twelfths of these twelfths. So these are sort of like one hundred and forty fourths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So this longer column here allows for the counting of one twelfths of a whole unit, which is called an uncia, from which the English words inch and ounce are derived, and making the abacus useful for Roman measures and Roman currency. So, in the Roman hand abacus, this first column was either a single slot with four beads, or in this case, three slots with one, one, and two beads, respectively. So, many measurements were aggregated by twelfths in Rome. Thus, the Roman pound, or libra, consisted of twelve ounces, or uncias, and a measure of volume was the congius, consisting of twelve hemenae, and the Roman foot was twelve inches, and the actus, the standard furrow length when plowing, was 150 pedes. So there was a lot of different lengths and sizes that were based on units of 12, which is why they provided for this in the Roman hand abacus. And because the principal coinage in Rome was divided into 12 uncie, again, it makes the abacus also ideally suited for counting currency. So you could call the Roman hand abacus a mixed base abacus, using basically decimal notation here and based on fractions of 12 on this side. So in summary, we know the Romans had a place value system. They had a representation of the value for zero, which was simply a column on the abacus without any beads entered. And they had a way of representing numbers that corresponded to their written Roman numeral notation system. The written system of Roman numerals on papyrus or paper correlates directly to the place values of the abacus, which is really important. Michael's example of a Roman hand abacus is patterned after an example that is in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris. So he's done a really great job of reproducing this. If you go online on online places like Amazon or whatever, and if you look for abacus, there's a whole bunch of inexpensively made abacuses on, available. What I really like about this, though, it offers something a little bit more unique than all those do, which is First of all, it has a case that protects it, but also protects the calculation in midstream. The inside velour padding and the inside of the lid means that you can clip this case shut, and now the beads aren't going to move around, and you can keep an intact calculation entered on the beads. And then this also gives the ability to keep the abacus clean, like dust-free. I know I live in a dusty environment here in the American Southwest, and if you leave the windows open any bit at all, you're going to have a dusty room in no time at all. It's nice being able to keep this clean and also, it is the modern Japanese Soroban 1-4 style beads on most of the rows here. And so you can do modern Soroban calculations on this Roman abacus, while at the same time you have this kind of connection with the ancient past, the ancient Greek and Roman culture, which is really kind of cool. It's sort of the best of the old and the best of contemporary abacus, which I think is a great idea. Michael, you've gone out of your way. You've hit the ball out of the park. Home run. Well done. Thank you. But also, there is a video that Michael sent me a link to in his letter, and I'll put a link down below in the description. It's a very detailed video about how the Roman abacus works, including the proper pronunciation of a lot of these words that I am sure I got wrong. But anyways, I wanted to thank Michael right now. Thank you for your patience, and I appreciate this abacus, and this is going to be a lot of fun using this in the future, and it's given me some inspiration for some new ideas also. In any event, I wish you guys the very best, and this is all about knowledge and creativity 
and I appreciate people like Michael with their in-depth knowledge of these arcane subject matter, and I wish you guys out there the very best to stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.